Hello and welcome to everyone with us today. Welcome to, in my own words, Holocaust Survivor Stories. The series is presented by a partnership between the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida and the USC Shoah Foundation. My name is Serena Ahmed and I am the program coordinator at our Holocaust Center. Our mission is to use the history and lessons of the Holocaust to form, to build a just and caring community free of anti-Semitism and all forms of prejudice and bigotry. We are located just north of downtown Orlando. We are currently open on a limited basis and many of you at the museum in person soon. It is an absolute honor to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Bernice Lerner and Ruth Merlstein. First, just a quick note, um, especially for those joining us for the very first time, please know to write questions into the chat box and our speakers will try and answer them by the end of the program. Now for a brief introduction to our incredible speakers and educators today. Dr. Bernice Lerner has lectured widely and in various settings across the globe. She served as director of Boston of the Boston University Center for the Advancement of Ethics and Character. Before and after this role, Bernice worked at Hebrew College, most recently as Dean of Adult Learning. She has more than 25 years of experience in the field of education, philosophy, and Jewish studies. She earned a bachelor's summa cum laude from Stony Brook University, a master's from the Jewish Theological Seminary, and a doctorate from Boston University. Just last year, in 2020, Dr. Bernice, Bernice Lerner published All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen Belsen which tells the story of her mom, Ruth, as well as Rachel Ruth, as well as the parallel narrative of a liberator. It is a very special opportunity that Ruth is speaking with Bernice today. Ruth Mermelstein, previously Rachel Ganuth, is a speaker for the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, through which she has shared her wartime experiences with nearly 300 school and other groups. It is such a privilege, Ruth and Bernice, to hear you two in conversation today. And now my honor to pass the program over to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you to um, Serena, to Lisa, and to Rachel, and to the Holocaust Center of um, Central Florida. We're really grateful for this opportunity. Um, I want my mom to have plenty of time to speak and you're all gonna wanna hear from her, but I thought I would start us off by showing you a few slides. I wanna say that uh, so, uh, this is really a three part program and um, it's the story of Rachel, Rachel Ruth, whom you see my mom, who's a survivor. And so it's really her story and it's the story of how she told me her story. And then it's the story of how I came to write her story. So we'll get bits and pieces of all of that in the program. But to start off, I just wanna show you a few slides. Um, let's see. So, um, as Serena said, I wrote this book called All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen Belsen. And you can see it was published simultaneously in the UK. And you can see that they both had the same images they were working with, but came up with completely different covers. And also they have, it's the same text in the book and they came up with different titles. But here you see, um, this is my mom and she is, um, she is 16 years old in this picture and she is, you could see that she's well nourished, but she was really, really sick. This was taken at a tuberculosis sanatorium in Arvika in Northwest Sweden. And you could see the look in her eyes. Sometimes you would see pictures of Holocaust survivors, maybe they're younger or a little older, maybe they're in the 20s, they're smiling, they're, you, they're coming back to life slowly, but um, you can imagine that for a young teenager who had endured indescribable losses of her family, of her childhood, um, really overwhelmed with physical and emotional pain and 
only she and her older sister survived the war. So here is a, a picture and you can sort of see the a little bit sad expression in her eyes. And here is a picture of Glenn Hughes, the other protagonist in my book, who I chose to write about as well, who was in charge of, of the relief efforts at Bergen-Belsen concentration camps, where my mother was. And it was a total shock to him. He was at this point, deputy director of medical services for the entire British Second Army. So in my book, so it took many years to figure out how to tell this dual the story. Um, and the way I chose to do it in the end with uh, my editor was to tell it over one year's time from the spring of 1944, where really um, things started to happen with my mother personally and, um, and the, the brigadier and go one year to the spring of 1945 and really how much can happen in one year's time here my mom is starting off she's a little she's a young girl in Siget and um, taken out of this small provincial Hungarian town of like maybe 12,000 Jews maybe 13,000 as they gathered people from the surrounding villages on their deportate deporting them and this was the route they took this railroad real way we no longer exists to Auschwitz. And then being taken out by miracle to a labor camp, Christianstadt, going on a death march and then winding up in March of 1945 in Bergen-Belsen. In March of 1945 in Bergen-Belsen is, was, the norm was death. Everybody there, it, they, a lot of war ravaged people who had already survived so much had been dumped there. And in just the month of March alone, 17 to 18,000 people died right there from no provisions, or no food, no water, no medical care, no hospital, hospitables, um, habitat, nothing. And here we have Glenn Hughes who starts off in preparing in the Yorkshire Wolds for his training his troops, training his medical, um, and personnel, how to evacuate casualties, how to treat the wounded. And here he is part of the D-Day invasion and has all these plans for it and calculates the number of casualties they're, they're going to have and starts commandeering hospitals all along the way. And what are the kinds of things that allies are concerned with? And he, as a medical military officer, is concerned with as they fight up through France and Belgium and finally cross the fortress of Germany and then are shocked to arrive in Bergen-Belsen. So uh, my mom's journey started off in Siget. These postcards are actually from before she was born. And the very sad thing is that we don't have a single photograph of my mom and her family from before the war. Um, it was, that was just a very sad thing. And here's the location of Siget. It uh, was right near the Ukraine. At the time she was deported, it was completely, was taken over by Hungary. In fact, it was taken over by Hungary in 1940. So she had this really sort of schizo uh, kind of schooling experience because she went to Romanian schools until she was 10 and then, then everything changed over to Hungarian schools. So, but you could see the area it was near. And it was the same town as Elie Wiesel. And I think my mom lived maybe around here she would know better how to explain. But my mom, my mom um, was very much affected by the war from the very beginning. Um, even though she was part of this Hungarian deportation in the spring of 1944, which was the largest and fastest, most rapid fire mass killing in probably in human history, where they deported more than 440,000 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz and and very, very fast. They had prepared the gas chambers and the, and the crematoria for them and killed 90% of them on arrival very quickly. My mom's story, uh, as I was re researching it and learning more, is really bookended in a way. Um, she was really affected by the what we know today as the Holocaust from the very first mass murder of Jews in August of 1941. So you may have heard of Babi Yar, but before Babi Yar was this other mass killings. And this was the very first one in Kamenets Podolsk in the Ukraine in August of 1941. And as 
and she was very much affected by this because um, certain Jews from her hometown were taken away to this area. Um, they were couldn't prove continual Hungarian citizenship and her aunt and uncle fell into this category. So her aunt and uncle and their spouses and their little children, her five little cousins under age 10, suddenly disappeared, were taken away from Siget in the uh, in actually July earlier as they were rounding them up and deported to this place and massacred. And her family was not, the things were not the same for her family from that time. So it's bookended by the first massacre and the, la the last method of killing of the Holocaust, which was just those who were already strong enough were taken to these they were marched away on these death marches away from the allied forces who might liberate them. No victim, Hitler said, should be left alive or turned over to the allies. And they were marched deep into Germany. And the largest dumping ground for them was Bergen-Belsen. So this camp really became a horror place uh, at the end of the war. And when the British came in, there were 55 to 60,000 people still alive and 10,000 unburied corpses and 17,000 who had been who had died just in March and it was a horrific scene. So I tremble in a way showing you these these photographs. Be, um, there it's it's very sad and we don't know who these people were and here you see that the SS is pressed, uh, whoever remained in the camp of the SS guards was pressed into service to help bury the, the dead people. And um, just as, a, as you look at these pictures, you might just ask yourself, what did the photographer have in mind? What did the photographer want? This, these are war trained war photographers from the British Film and Photographic Unit. And they, I have to tell you that when I read their accounts, like some of them, they became so sick from doing this work, but they were, that was their charge to document this. And it was the most documented liberation in history. It, they took so many photographs and films and some of them vowed they would never again take photographs um, because it was such a horrifying experience for them and so tragic. But so you could just look and think, what did the photographer want to show us? So here you can see the sort of image of Rabbi Leslie Hardman, who was a chaplain with the British Second Army. And he is really bereft at how people were being thrown helter skelter into these mass graves. And he just, it was a heartache for him. And he was working around the clock with the survivors. And here we saw the SS. Here you see if three days after the liberation, all rescue efforts, as we know, in today's time, times take time. And it took three days before even they got um, tents in to pitch right outside the huts in Bergen-Belsen. And the reason was that they wanted to be able to get some, some bit of food, if they could, a, or a sip of water to people inside the huts who could not walk or were not ambulatory. So if you could walk, you would be asked to leave and to go into one of these huts. And my mom has a big story about that. And here, my mom can also tell you why this woman has a square cut out of the back of her coat. And maybe she'll tell you after the slides. And again, this image I think holds resonance from my mom um, being at least able at the end of the war to run for some potatoes and try to cook them. So um, I did some calculations that are really reflect the Holocaust in general and who survived. And this is just a microcosm, a small, tiny sampling, but this is the birth year of Bergen-Belsen survivors from Siget who arrived in Sweden, who were taken to Sweden. Now the Swedish Red Cross came in at the end of the war and took about 7,000 of the very sick survivors from Bergen-Belsen to Sweden, aiming to get them on their feet to rehabilitate them. They thought maybe it would take six months. And they, like the British thought, 
maybe people will be repatriated, can, could go back to their home country. Well, this happened in some cases with people, some people did go back, but very few went back to Eastern Europe, some went back to Western Europe, but most people could not go back to the homes and communities they had prior to the war that had been completely destroyed. But anyway, so there were about 174 people. So remember that the about 13,000 people were deported from Siget to Auschwitz and 90% were gassed upon arrival and or burned or shot upon arrival. And at the end of the war, this is the very end. This is who remained, who not everyone from Siget who survived the war wound up in Bergen-Belsen and not everyone in from Siget who was in Bergen-Belsen wound up going to Sweden. But this does show you, it does give you a sense of who, what age group survived. So you could see this really only a couple of people in their 50s, they almost had no chance. And there was some people who were around 40 years old, most were or 30 years old. The greatest number of survivors were in their 20s, um, 1924. So um, that was, 21, 22, 23, 24 years old. In blue, I uh, highlighted the age that my aunts were when they survived. And you could see in red, my mom was one of the few, the, one of the youngest survivors of the Holocaust because she was deported to Auschwitz at age 14 and very few people had a chance. So she actually, she knows these younger people but she was among the very few and then finally, we come. Uh, the, my, book, my book ends with an epilogue, which I'll just give you a little bit of here, showing you some images. This is the very first photograph we ever have. We have of my mom. This was taken in a place called Katrina Home. It was the first makeshift hospital quarantine that she was in when she uh, after she was after she got to Sweden, and she is. Uh, 15 years old in this picture and you can still see that she had black and blue marks under her eyes. She was very severely beaten up in Bergen-Belsen at the end of the war after the liberation, which is a whole story unto itself. And it took, um, took a long time. I gave a talk recently on adversity, overcoming adversity, and I don't Adversary, adversity ex affects different people in different ways, right? And adversity comes in all forms of seriousness, but it takes time, it took time. And it took a lot of, uh, I would say, healing experiences in Sweden and encounters with people who were kind and caring. And eventually my mom became a young lady. It's, this is she and her sister in their early twenties in Sweden, they're only survivors from a family that with their aunts and uncles and cousins was more than 30 people. They're the only ones who survived. And here is a picture of my dad when he was in a displaced persons camp and he was also a survivor of the Holocaust. His parents were also murdered in Auschwitz. And here is their wedding photo. And my mom can tell you that they had a lovely wedding with friends, but absolutely no one from their families. And here's my mom today um, and I love this picture of her and I'm very proud of her and we're very fortunate that she's with us on this call and she'll be happy to answer any of your questions and yeah she speaks to groups all over the world. And here's Glenn Hughes and you could see the seriousness in his eyes when he is at the camp and he um, he was a find in terms of writing about a subject that should be probably as well known as an Oscar Schindler because he displayed great compassion for the survivors and was really struggling with this part of his life. It became a watershed experience in his life. And his compassion was noted by the survivors so much so that the hospital that, that was set up on the premises right near um, Bergen-Belsen, the largest hospital in Europe with 14,000 patients ultimately in May and June of 1945 was called, they named it the Glenn Hughes Hospital. And there are now, there are, hopefully, I don't know if most of them are still alive. If there were 2000 babies born in the Glenn Hughes Hospital in the years after the war. And here he is later on in his life. He was a great sportsman. He was 
here he's playing golf, but he was a famous rugby player and he did some really important work after the war. He was part of starting the National Health Service in England and he was really instrumental in inspiring the founder of the hospice movement. He had seen people suffer so much and die horrendous deaths and yeah, he devoted the last part of his life to researching how should people should be treated in their last days. So I'm going to stop the share now. And my mom and I are both here to take any questions you may have. I know Serena had some really thoughtful questions for us. Thank yeah. you so, so much, Dr. Lerner. Thank you so, so much. Um, Bernice and Ruth, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we're so thankful to you for your time today. Um, there are questions coming in through the chat. Um, and so thank you so much for engaging us and engaging in this way in a question and answer sort of format with the audience. Um, and so I will, um, I'll start with a couple of questions from the audience and also I'll use my, my privilege as a moderator here to um, but ask some questions from myself as well, if I may. Um, and perhaps maybe that's where I should start, actually. I'll, I'll track back a little bit. Uh, Dr. Lerner, I was wondering if you could start us off by, you know, explaining to us a little bit of, on where you got the inspiration from to write your most recent book with the parallel, parallel narratives of both your mom's experiences, um, Rachel Ruth and, and Liberator Glenn Hughes. Yeah, so um, I really I really like telling stories, situating people in a context to help teach a history. But also, um, I think it's really hard to grasp really vast numbers. But if you look at the individual person and connect with somebody, a protagonist, it helps you to really understand. The more granular you can get, the greater your understanding of the larger event. So I had these two protagonists. So I came across, I came to Glenn Hughes by asking the question, how precisely did my mom survive? What were the actual mechanics, the logistics of her being taken from a dung infested hut where she was laying, so, she was so sick to a makeshift hospital. And she had fallen unconscious um, after being beaten up at the end of the war and couldn't well, she could tell me so many other things. She couldn't tell me exactly what happened then. So that led me to research the liberation and the man most prominently associated with it was Glenn Hughes. And I started to research him and he became this really compelling character. My mom, writing about my mom's story, even though uh, she told me things my entire life, this is, I remember I did not, I never sat down to formally interview my mom. I never had a tape recorder. I never took notes when she was speaking. It happened organically over very many years. And I was very blessed to have her still with me. And people were asking me, what about telling your mom's story? And I had her with me. And so I thought I really wanted to commemorate, to memorialize members of our family who had died, who had been killed, who would just vanish into oblivion. Their, they, their names wouldn't even be recorded anywhere. So this was a way of also telling their story, telling her story, and I could always call her and she was always very forthcoming with any questions I had. So that's how it came about. Thank you, Dr. Lerner. And um, actually a lead facilitator from our uh, Holocaust Center's book club, Felicia Smith, she wrote, um, she was asked, actually asking the same question. I didn't get it, I didn't see it before I asked. Um, thank you for writing this incredible book and showcasing your mom's amazing story. Um, the next question that I uh, am honored to pose, um, Julia Ban asks, Ruth, did you meet any Holocaust survivors who were from Hungary who also went to Auschwitz? She says her beloved grandma Ban was a survivor also from Hungary and survived Auschwitz as well and told her story for many years. Um, but the question being, did you meet any survivors um, also from Hungary who went to Auschwitz? Oh yes, survivors try to get together whenever they can. 
and earlier when we were all younger, I met many of them. I still have one friend that I went to school with. She lives in Brooklyn, so we are in touch right now also. But there were many, I mean, in Hungary, they took so many people, <coughs> so many people to Auschwitz, <coughs> excuse me. Yes. <coughs> Some of, some of us who came to Sweden, we became good friends, not necessarily from my hometown, but from other places. Those who became to live in Sweden for a long time and we made very close friends because we didn't have family. So, and we got together with all like a large family, just with friends. Thank you so much. And Ruth, may I ask you, what is the story behind um, your name change from Rachel to Ruth? Well, <clears throat> when my daughter wrote the book and she knew that my original name was Rachel, that was my given name, the Jewish name Rachel. And well, I had so many names in between. I have so, because I was confusing to have so many names, but when I went to Romanian school, they called me Regina. When I went to Hungarian school, they called me Regina, the same spelling, different pronunciation. Mm -hmm. When I was taken to, to Auschwitz, I couldn't have one or just any of those names. They called me Rosa. And then when I came to Sweden, I changed my name again. I didn't like Rosa, so I called myself Rosalia. Anyway, I have all these names and it's confusing and I like Rachel best. So when I heard that one of the ladies, one of the girls who works at the Holocaust Center, she calls herself Rachel Cara. So I thought to myself, why can't I call myself Rachel, Rachel Ruth? I still have difficulty with Ruth. I cannot pronounce uh, TH. So I'm happy to be Rachel back. And my daughter gave it back to me because she wrote my story as Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, and in the book, I was wondering, Dr. Lerner and Ruth, if you would both speak a little bit more to um, the Swedish family, the, the Schnabel family. Um, not everyone in our audience here with us today has, has read the book. And so I was wondering if you would speak a little bit about um, who this family was, what they meant to you, and if you stayed in touch with them. Yes, it all started. I was going to the, when I was feeling better when I was out of the hospitals and I went to some schools and and then I had to go to work and I was working in a factory. This is the second job I had. The first job was when they, they told me you are 18 years old, now you have to go to work and support yourself. It was very hard to be on my own to support myself and to, to have living, living conditions in places that I like to be. And so when I was working in this factory, uh, I also went to, to the Jewish organization to play cards and do other things. And one of the young people there, they said, how would you like to spend a Passover at a Jewish family? Uh, I hadn't spent a, a Passover with a family for almost five years. So I said, oh yeah, I would like to. So you could help out there and you could spend Passover with them, with the Schnabel family. So it worked out very good. I helped out there and I was very happy to be with his family because they're all very kind. And they had a little grandson, the young woman had a little boy. They lived, he was born in New York. And the grandparents also were during the war in New York and they saw that the daughter is suffering. She didn't have a good life with her husband. So he came back to Sweden and with a little boy, and the little boy became a problem child because the mother had to go to work and, and they couldn't have any governor so we'd stay with him or take care of him. And his grandma had a hard time because he was very rough with her. And when I was there, somehow or another, the kid took a liking to me. And then the mother asked me if I would babysit for him at, when she goes out because she was a single woman now. And I said, yes, I would because I was getting a little extra money and I always needed some money to buy clothes or whatever. And then they said, why don't you give up your job completely at the factory and come and be with us and take care of my little boy after he comes back from school in the afternoon and the morning you're going to work in the jewelry store. And that's what I did. 
I joined the family like a member of them, of the family. They liked me so very much that finally they even made the wedding for me. I did a lot. I think, I think the schnabels were a part of my mom's healing. I mean. Thank you so much. And um, we have a, this is a quick question related to um, how she sought refuge in Sweden. And um, if you both wouldn't mind speaking a little bit more to um, that story and that experience of going from Bergen-Belsen to, to Sweden. But there's a question here from Lila Tinkoff. Did your mother by any chance know a Harriet Feldman at Bergen-Belsen? Um, she was from Poland, age 14, who also survived and was sent to Sweden. And there's a few questions here. Another person, Todd, asked, are there any other memoirs you've examined from those who've survived from Saget and found refuge in Sweden? So if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit more to this, this story and this experience of to find refuge there. Well, I was very sick at the end of the war in Bergen-Belsen. I practically was unconscious. And uh, when the Brigadier General made sure that put me in a hospital to wash me over, they had to put me in a human laundry and wash me over and put me in a clean sheet and put me in a hospital. I was in a hospital with 11 girls. Every morning they took out 11 dead and they brought in 11 dying. And it was very sad because I knew that my sister was looking for me. And she, I, she, couldn't, she, she couldn't find me because there was such a commotion going on in Bergen Belgium. So after three weeks, she found me and she was, she must've been very happy, but I was still semi-conscious semi and I didn't know what was going on. She must've been happy that I was alive and she went to the village and she went, brought me some fresh vegetables like scallions and I started to eat the scallions in the hospital as soon as I opened up my eyes. And I got an appetite. And then I could even go crawl down from my bed to the night tables, but the other girls died during the, during the night and take some food from there. And one day when one day when I was feeling a little bit stronger, I sat up in my bed and the nurse comes in and she says, you are so lucky you survived, but all those other girls died. All the three, the three weeks before that, they, every morning they took out 11 dead and brought in 11 dying and I still was alive. And the nurse says to me, you are so lucky you survived while all those other girls died here. I said, yes, how lucky am I? I lost my family, I lost my home, I lost all my relatives and, and I lost my health. I felt so sorry for myself. But after, after a couple of weeks more and months later, the Swedish Red Cross came into Bergen Belgium and took as many uh, 7,000, maybe 7,000 people from sick people to Sweden. And then we arrived in Sweden, we were in quarantine, and then we were sent to different hospitals. First a makeshift hospital in Katrina Holm, and then a real tuberculosis sanatorium in the north of Sweden to Arvika. And they tried to make us healthy to put us on our feet. The Swedish government was wonderful. Later on, they also instituted that all the, all the girls, all the children, boys and girls who were under 18 years old have to go to school. So they organized internet schools for children from many European countries to be together. And we had their wonderful teachers. The teachers were also survivors. They were teachers in Europe before and they were very kind. They tried to, tried to tell us you don't have to come to class if you don't feel like it. They were wonderful. And they tried to teach us not just arithmetic and, and history and, and languages. They also tried to give us some culture to teach, to teach us music appreciation and, and to read good books and to and to go to try to live next to a uh, large city capital where we have access to go to opera and ballet and and uh, concerts. So they give us they give us new life, and the teachers are so wonderful. So anyway, we had to leave the school, and then I had to support myself. And I had I the only job I could really get was to work in a hospital. So I worked there till till I got a re relapse. 
because I was working in the operating room and I saw all those operations and I had nightmares and I got a relapse. They sent me away. So they sent me to a rehab and I didn't get well. So I came back as a patient in the same hospital. And I had several times relapses, which was very bad. My teenage years were not the best, but I survived it. So I think um, in, in terms of the question, I, I read everything I could get my hands on about people who had journeys that were sort of similar to my mom's, uh, whatever I could. My aunt actually wrote a, an unpublished book about what it was like to be taken out of Bergen-Belsen and taken to Sweden. So I had, a, I, and I certainly tried to uncover anything I could about my mom being in the labor camp Christian stat, she had a very particular kind of experience there. So I tried to get more of the context by reading anything anyone wrote about that um, and the death march that she was on. But I just wanna say that the kinds of things my mom is talking about, um, I, I didn't realize, I don't think I, because she's such a positive person and because she didn't get married and have me until she got married 10 years after, the, nine years after the war and then had me 10, 11 years after the war. And when she, so she had time to sort of come to her own in Sweden. Sweden. It was a very healing kind of place for her because she had that experience of meeting the Schnabel family. She had that experience of being in that school for uh, teenage survivors. And those were real, she had some positive experiences. So when she was telling me her story, she had a lot of things to tell me even when I was a kid in terms of her childhood in Siget and her adventures in Sweden. But she, I didn't realize until I really sat down to dig deep into writing her book, how hard it was, how some of these experiences were so hard, even in Sweden, how disruptive it was to constantly have these relapses and be sent back to TB sanatoriums. Thank you both so much. Um, it's such a gift to be in conversation with both, uh, with both of you. And um, there's a question here from Felicia Smith um, related to the relationship um, between Ruth and Elizabeth, um, your sister. As I was reading the book, she says, I was touched by the relationship between you and your sister and how you fought to survive for each other. Will you please tell us more about that and how your relationship continued after the war? We were always very close. My sister was a wonderful person, really. Unfortunately, she died very young because she and the concentration camp worked in asbestos mines and her uniform was always covered with asbestos and she paid the price for it later on. She did have, she got married and thank God she got married to a man in Sweden and the man, my brother-in-law had a brother in the United States and a, a brother can take out a brother and his wife. And when we separated, we were very unhappy. There are pictures of me saying goodbye to my sister when she was leaving me. But she's, my sister said, don't worry, within a year's time, I'm going to bring you to America also. And I thought that was going to be a pipe dream. How is she going to bring me to America? I had tuberculosis and I, my Romanian quota was very low. I mean, I definitely couldn't get come to America on my, from Romain, being a Romanian born. And, but she kept her promise that within a year's time, I'm going to bring you to America. And she did. Within the year, it was a miracle because when she came here a couple of months after she was here with, my, with her husband, she went to a, to a pooling party and she met some she met some girls that were with us together in the concentration camp and they started to talk. They were very happy, very happy to meet up because we are together a long time. And they asked about me and my sister told her about, took out a picture and showed her, showed the two sisters that I'm doing all right, I'm a sweet. And they also said they have a single brother and the light went up in my sister's head. She was going to, she gave the girls a picture of me to their brother and we started to write to each other. We wrote for about six months. I was supposed to come to Canada and with the Romanian quota, they didn't let me to come to Canada either. Mm -hmm. So my sister and brother went over to my future husband. We were writing to each other. We knew we, we have something in common. We have the same goals. 
and we came from the same back, similar background. And they told him, listen, she would like to come to Canada, but they don't let her there. So I wrote a very sad letter. So my sister and brother went over to my future husband and said, you are an American citizen already. You work very hard. Why don't you take a vacation and go to Sweden and marry her there? And guess what? He did. He did come to Sweden. And after five days there, we had a very nice wedding. But I couldn't come back with him at the same time as he had to leave come back here because it was around Christmas time and the papers got lost. So finally by, we were married in December. So finally by February, he had to get the lawyer to try to find the marriage certificate, the, the license. And, and then I came over here in April, April 1st or April 2nd, 1955. And I have been since then here and I had a wonderful life with my husband. We had, we got along for 50, we only knew each other for 10 days and, and then got married and it worked out very nicely because he was a wonderful man and I had 58 years, 57 and a half wonderful years with my husband. We had two daughters and we brought them up also on Long Island. That's my story. I'm very happy to be in America because this is still the best country in the world. Thank you so much, Rachel. Dr. Lerner, do you want to add any um, you know, thoughts uh, in relation to that story, especially that um, you know, immigration to the United States and growing up? Um... Yeah, it's kind of, you know, there's a, it's, it's actually a very contemporary story in a way because everybody's like meeting online and <laughs> people are, you know, there's this, television show I don't know if you've seen it it's kind of kooky it's called 90 day fiance which it reminds me a lot of my parents you know but they had a lot in common but you asked about the question was about my mom's relationship with her sister and that's a very powerful thing in the book and I think my mom would say that it was you know any any survivor would say it was really hard to survive by yourself uh, it was if you had a relative a close relative a close you know the closer the more people kind of stuck together. And my aunt did risk her life to be with my mom. And my mom risked her life many times to help my aunt survive too. And it was a very powerful love relationship between sisters that I witnessed my whole life. Thank you so, so much. And um, we have so many questions of, of our community wanting to hear your thoughts on um, human rights violations and crises in the present. Um, but before we move to the present, um, I was uh, wanting to, you know, honor two more questions that we have here um, on the past. And one of those is from Kim Johnson, um, who asks if you would describe um, more about uh, pre-war life in Siget, um, more about your hometown, uh, and um, those moments, uh, you know, that that you feel uh, that you want to share today, um, where you were taken uh, with your family to uh, Auschwitz. Well, my childhood was very, very pleasant. My mother, we were six children in the family, and my mother loved us all. She, she used to say she would like to have a, a dozen plus ten. Anyway, we were six, and life was. Life was okay till the Hungarians came in because the Hungarians, Hungary was alive with Nazi Germany, so they brought in all the anti Semitic laws right away in 1940. And then life started to be hard. My father always always had connections with uh, Gentile, with Gentile landowners, uh, orchard donors, and he had a good relationship with them because he made, they liked each other, whatever he did with the uh, in business and and we had general friends also in the neighborhood. We got along very nice until, until the Hungarians came in. When the Hungarians came in, then things changed. We hoped for it would be better because till up till 1918, it was also Hungary and my parents went to Hungarian school and during the Romanian time, they had a hard time helping us out with, with homework. But now the Hungarians came in and the people were happy, but things turned bad because Hungary was alive with Nazi Germany. 
So after 10 years old, it was fine. But then in 1941, when they took away my aunt and, and my uncle with their families, our life was not the same. And people couldn't do the same business as they usually did. After when I was, from the time I was 10 years old, our life was not the same because they took away about half of the family to murder them. As a matter of fact, one man happened to come back to tell us how it had all happened. And we called them a madman because nobody wanted to believe that this would be, could be done in the 20th century, that human, the children, beautiful children and healthy young men and women under 40 were going to be murdered just because they were born Jews. So things started to be bad, but also, so my memories from the time the Hungarians came in was not very pleasant because by 1942, first the Hungarians called up all the young men to forced labor. And later they called up the older men. My father was 41 years old in 1942 and he was called up to forced labor. And my mother was pregnant with a sick child. So life was very hard for us at that point. But by a miracle, somehow my father managed to survive. He worked very hard summer and winter in their civilian clothes with poor, poor nutrition and poor sanitary conditions. And when the, all the men, when they got sick, about 700 men, they put them in a big hole, like a big barn. And they made sure that the doors were all closed and they put gasoline around the building and put the building on fire. And with all this men, because they couldn't work anymore to burn them alive just because they were weak. It so happened a few of them managed to escape the burning building and crawl away from it while the soldiers were standing, standing around the building and shooting at those who tried to escape. But my father and, and two other men that he helped get out from the burning building escaped and they were crawling into the woods and the woods, some partisans found them and the men were very weak and the partisans said, we can take you now to Russia, this was 1943. Russia is already liberated from the Germans and you will be free, you will be safe there. But the men also said, if you want to go back to your own families, you have to remember that all the Jewish families in Europe are going to be murdered. And my father and the two other men said, whatever is going to be to happen to our families is going to happen to us too. We want to rejoin our families. So the partisans, who were always against the war, tried to do sabotage and things like that. They took the three men to a hospital in the Ukraine. And when they got stronger, but three weeks later, my mother gets a telegram. She should come and pick up my father because he's in the hospital there and she should bring him home. So my grandma came to stay with us with a baby to take care of the baby. She was six months old at that point or whatever. And, and then my, my mother brought my father home and we were so happy to have him home. That was the happiest year we had together because people came from all over to ask, did you see my husband? Did you see my brother? Did you see my son? But my father never wanted to tell what really happened to them. Not like earlier when the man who came back from, from the mass grave and they took away 20 to 30,000 people to the mass graves and he came back and he said, but he was telling that they were all murdered. Nobody wanted to believe him. They said he was a madman. But now my father didn't want to say anything bad about the man that he met, that the people came to ask about. He said, the last time I saw them, they were in good shape. They, you just have to have hope you're going to see them again. So this year, well, it was very hard. My father couldn't do the same business as he did before because Jews cannot do any business with Christians. They took away all the businesses from the Jewish people and gave them to the Christians. It was very hard to make a living, but because he helped these two other men escape the burning building, they were well off men and they knew how to make a, how to make a money. So they gave him some ideas. He should try to get scrap, scrap metal and raw rubber for the war effort. And they told him where to go and how to sell it. And he did, and sure enough, he made the good money and we all got new clothes and we all got new shoes specially made because we didn't know what was going to happen during the next year or so. So my mother prepared now for the Passover Seder. We are preparing everything like we usually do, celebrating the liberation of the Jews from Egypt and now celebrating 
a deliberation Passover. And by tradition, we sit down by the table and my grandmother was there and my aunt with a little baby and, and we sit around the table, all of us, and we open up the door for, for the prophet Elijah to come in. We, the door was open, so instead of the prophet Elijah, in came our janitor. He was drunk, he saw the door was open, so he came straight to the dining room table and knocked very hard on the table. He says, you are good people, don't worry. The war is going to be over in one, in one year's time. That was 1944 in April 18, 1944 for Passover. We celebrate and my, my father gives the guy a goblet of wine and, and walks him out of the, of the house. And, and when he came back in, my father says, when the drunk speaks, he speaks the truth. Sure enough, I was liberated exactly a year later, but nobody could, could have prepared us what that year would bring. Because right after Passover, Eichmann came in and organized all the Jewish people into ghettos. And after being in the ghetto for four or five weeks, finally told us, yeah, it's ready. we are going to go someplace else. We had no idea where it was. The Russians were so near, we were hoping the Russians are going to occupy Sigurd. But no, they took us in box cars. They took us out from our home and we are sit sitting a whole day in the sun beating down on us. And my little baby sister, she was crying because she practically was sunstroke on her face. My mother couldn't protect her. And, and after late afternoon, when everybody was out from their homes, they took us to the first synagogue. My mother prepared certain things because children always need food. But whatever we tried to take along, you couldn't take suitcases, just pillowcases with food and things like that and some utensils because rumors were that we might be resettled in the, in the interior of Hungary, work on a farm or something like that, but that wasn't so. We were taken to, the first synagogue was full to the rafters, so we had to go to the second one. By that time we had to drop everything by the side of the road because we couldn't carry it anymore. And we were pushed into the big syn old synagogue. It was full to the rafters and elderly people were crying and, and fainting and children were crying and practically nobody slept. The next morning they chased us out from there and we were marching down a beautiful boulevard where rich Jewish people used to live. And we came to the train station and there boxcars were lined up, maybe 30 or 40 boxcars. They pushed in 80 to 100 people in those boxcars. That's the way it all started for us, coming to Auschwitz. The boxcars were very, very crowded and stifling in the hot May, May days. And you sooner or later, when you're in the boxcars for days, sooner or later you have to go to the toilet. And my mother lifted up a coat, a coat around me because who were in, the, in these boxcars? There was only school children and elderly and mothers and small, mothers and small children but you have to do what you have to do. At one point it was so stifling in the boxcars that I hardly could breathe. I wasn't drinking water because the water was needed for the, for the children and the elderly. Every, every day the, box, the train stopped at a different town and they emptied out the pail of excrements and brought in a new pail of water. And then we are traveling like this for, for the three nights and four days. At one point, my father had to give a passing, passing a meadow, and my I, I hardly could breathe. So my father get, took me to the to the little window. There was little windows high up on the box cars, and he lifted me up. And he said, "Look, look at those nice Holstein cows feeding themselves, grazing in the meadows. They are well, they're the best cows. They." They are hosting cows, they give the most milk. He always tried to teach me whatever. He was in the fruit business, so he was trying to teach me everything about the fruit. And now he lifted me up and he says, you are a strong girl. See how nice freely those cows are grazing. One day you are going to be free too, and you are going to talk about your experience. And those, those last words that my father told me, that I'm a strong girl, I'm going to make it, I'm going to talk about it. This is my sacred duty that I have to talk about my experience because my father had confidence to me that I will make it. 
I suffered a lot, but I made it because I just had to live because my father had confidence in me. Rachel, Ruth, um, thank you so, so much. The chat has been quiet. Um, we're all just, thank you for gifting us with your experiences, your story. We're all just sitting here on the edge of our seats, I know, listening intently. And I'm going to be quiet because we have very little time left and I want us to hear from you as much as possible in the time that we have together to you and your daughter. Thank you so, so much. Um, moving to, uh, you know, I apologize as we kind of move to the present. Um, and uh, Kristen Bryant, who's a teacher, she says, I'm a teacher of middle school students. Um, what do you think is the most important lesson you want today's students to know after studying the Holocaust? I want they should speak up and not be a be an upstander and not a bystander. If they see anything that is that is not right, they should speak up. They should have resilience and be confident that they could do something to help others and do the best that they can. Because we are living through a very rough time right now. I feel sorry for because of the of the coronavirus of this epidemic that people are suffering. Children cannot really attend school like usually and be together with friends but they have to be strong. They have to have pers persistence and hoping that things are going to get better. Just have to have hope and not give up, not give in to any kind of sadness. Try to be happy as much as you can. Thank you so, so much. Um, and if I may, I know we have little time, but just ask one more question. Um, I know this is a large question, but with, with rises in extremism and anti-Semitism today, what are responses or actions on the top of both of your minds, Dr. Bernice Lerner and Rachel Ruth, that we can take as global citizens? We always have to speak up. Yeah, I think also um, one of the reasons I like to write about Glenn Hughes is that he could see through these demoralized, ravaged war victims and see the humanity in them. And to look at someone not as the stranger, but as a human wor being worthy of dignity and to regard each person, the sacredness in each person. And I just want to say a word about my mom, how wonderful it is to still have her with us. And I was very fortunate to have her for so many years. And it really helped me to tell her story and inform the book. Her childhood she had a very solid, happy childhood, as she said, up until age 10. But I realized also that as the second of six children, she had enormous responsibility. She was working very hard. She helped her grandmother with her butcher business. She helped her father with his fruit business. She didn't have, uh, parts of her childhood were, she didn't have. When I was a little girl, she would stay up late at night sewing me doll clothes. And those are so precious for me because I felt like her, just her childhood was a little bit disrupted. She didn't have a chance to do as much of those childhood creative, creative experiences. So, um, but I want to say also that she would sometimes tell me a story. Can you imagine your parent talking to your parent and, or, and they remember something that they witnessed or, or overheard when they were 12 or 13 years old. The story she told about her father being locked in this building that was burned down where there were 600 men and almost nearly all of them were killed in this fire. She, she overheard this. She overheard him telling this story to men. He didn't tell her directly. She, over, she sat by his feet because she adored him and she overheard him speaking it to other people. She told me, and then I saw that it was written up in the history books. I could find other accounts of this event. This was the greatest massacre of the Hungarian forced laborers. And so whatever little window she had, these little hints of things that she remembered as a kid were windows into a much bigger story. Thank you, thank you both. Um... I, I'm going to move into conclusion, but you know, I do want to give an opportunity, Dr. Lerner and Rachel Ruth, do you have any um, final words that you'd like to leave us with today? Um, I would just really like to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all. And thank you, Ma, for being here. It was so nice to see you. My mom and I live in different cities now, so we only see each other on Zoom talks. 
So it was really, really precious for me. Thank you. And thank you, everybody who listened, who was here. I also want to say thank you for you all for listening. I didn't, I wasn't very good speaking. And my speech is not so good lately. I don't know why, but I used to tell my daughter stories that no mother told their children. I told her how I used to grab dead bodies by the ankles and pull them to the mass grave. I used, she used to, she used to ask questions all the time. Finally, when she was 14 years old, I could tell her very sad stories. So, because what happened to me when I was 14. Anyway, thank you all very much for listening. And I hope you don't have any nightmares and that you keep on having, being strong and being resilient and helping others when you can and be happy. Ruth and Bernice, we cannot thank you both enough for sharing your family story with us all today. Um, I only feel as inspired and strong as I do because after reading your book and listening to you today. So thank you, thank you so, so much to listen and to learn from you both in conversation has been a treasure. Um, and it has been a such, a such a special, rare opportunity to hear you both in dialogue. Thank you, thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much. And oh, um, just as a, some concluding words today, um, to have uh, you know, thank you so much to our audience always for being with us and for writing such meaningful questions, dialogues into the chat. If anyone would like to reach out to our speakers today directly, you may contact them through Dr. Bernice Lerner's website, www.berniselerner.com, which I'm putting also into the chat. On her website, you can also find out more information on how to purchase the book, All the Horrors of War. And now in conclusion of this incredible event today, I have a few just important reminders or new announcements for those joining us for the first time. After today, you will receive an email with a link to take a short survey where you can provide your feedback, which we greatly appreciate if you'll be able to take just a few moments to tell us how we can improve our time together in all future events. The recording of today's event will be uploaded to our website by tomorrow. Please share with any family, friends, colleagues who missed this important discussion to watch at their leisure. There are also being links posted into the chat where you can donate to the Holocaust Center and support our mission. Thank you all so much for your financial support to keep these special programs and conversations going. And our next virtual program will actually be next Wednesday, February 17th from noon to 1 p.m. You do not want to miss this opportunity to hear our speaker, Richard E. Lapchik, human rights activist who will be discussing how we can face uncomfortable truths. He'll be introduced by a special guest, Mark Pollock. Links are being posted into the chat by my colleagues where you can click see all of our events and register we hope to see you all there. And on behalf of the Holocaust Center, thank you all so, so much for being with us today. Thank you, Rachel Ruth and Dr. Bernice Lerner. I hope you all stay safe. Hope to see you soon at our upcoming events or in person at our museum. And please have a wonderful rest of your day and please stay safe. Thank you very much.